Hi everybody and welcome to Marine Fishes. So we're finally going to be moving into the phylum Chordata and all of the, the animals that come in that phylum, which is really, there's a lot. And these are kind of the animals that you're going to be thinking of. Like if you think of a marine animal, you probably think of dolphins and whales and stuff like that. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in the next couple lectures. Um, so it's one of my absolute favorite uh, groups, you know, the fishes. But I think you're going to really, really like it. So we do have this lecture broken up into two different parts. It is fishes part one and fishes part two. Um, so again, this is going to be the beginning of Cornata. So let's just go ahead and just jump right in. Um, now I should mention that there are a couple of phylums that we're going to be skipping and not just phylums. There are kind of big groups like the cephalochordatas, um, the urochordatas, the salps, the tunicates. We're not really going to be talking about those so much. Um, we would have if we had actually like gone into the lab, but unfortunately we don't, you know, get a chance to. So we're just going to be doing our best and we're just going to be moving on to marine fishes right now. So without further ado, marine fishes. Okay, so the first group that we're going to be talking about are going to basically be right in here. Okay, so this is going to be your agnathans, your chondrichthys, and your osteichthys. So we're still under the phylum chordata. You can't really see it right here, but we're in the domain eukarya. We're in the kingdom animalia. And now we're actually going to be getting into all of these different ones right here under the phylum chordata. Um, so first off, we're going to talk about the agnathans, and then we're going to move on to all sorts of good things like the chondrichthys and the osteichthys. All right, so but first, let's just talk about marine fish in general. So marine fish are the oldest of all the vertebrates. Again, we kind of really think that this is where life started in the ocean, and this is exactly what happened is we had fishes first, and then those first initial fishes started to kind of work their way up on land, and that's how we actually got land animals um, and land vertebrates. So these guys are the oldest of all the vertebrates. Now, you might think automatically, like, oh, vertebrates, that means you have bones, and that's not necessarily true. So sometimes you have bone and sometimes you actually have cartilage. Okay, so two different types of actual structures. Um, now, let's see, the fishes are the largest of all the vertebrate groups. So we're going to be talking about lots of different vertebrate groups, but nobody compares to the fishes. That's because they were the first, they've been around the longest, and that means you're going to get evolution diverging out into a bunch of different groups, and therefore you're going to get a lot of diversity when it comes to these marine fishes. Um, let's see. Uh, there's about 24,000 known species of fish, and more than half of that, about 15,000, are going to be marine. So that is a lot, a lot of fishes. Um, now, getting on to the taxonomy side, and I know you're going to hate me for this one, but we got to do it. So this is the, the taxonomy where we're at right now. We're in the phylum chordata. We're in the subphylum vertebrata. Okay, there's, again, urochordatas, and we're not talking about any of those. We're in the subphylum vertebrata. The superclass. Super class, not just class, super class, agnatha. These are the jawless fish. So agnatha kind of A means non, and natha means like jaws or hinged jaw. So these guys do not actually have a jaw. It doesn't mean they don't have a mouth. It just means they don't have a hinged jaw. Uh, next up is going to be the super class chondrichthys. These are going to be your cartilaginous fishes. So you can think your sharks, your skates, your rays. And then finally, you're going to have the super class osteichthys, which are going to be your bony fishes. So think of like your tunas, your salmons, and stuff like that. Now, these big scary words like chondrichthys and osteichthys, do you need to know the spelling? If we were in class, I would say yes, 100%. Because we're online, you gotta get close. You gotta get close. If you're one or two letters off, it's okay, but you gotta get close. All right, so again, let's look at these groups just kind of a little bit more um, in depth and, and who's in what group. So again, we have the echnathans, the jawless fishes. Those include the hagfish and the lampreys. You can see this guy right here, so you can clearly see his mouth and his little teeth, but he does not actually have a hinged jaw. You can see the chondrichthys right here, the cartilaginous fishes, and again, those are your sharks, your skates, your rays, and you can see this little ratfish right here. This is neither a shark, a skate, or a ray. This is a ratfish. This is a chimerin. Okay, so they still have a cartilaginous skeleton. In fact, this is one of the first bony fishes ever. Um, really, kind of starts with the agnathans, and it kind of moves to the chondrichthys. Um, and so the, this ratfish is actually very, very old and ancient. And so also have cartilaginous skeletons. And then finally you have your osteichthys, which include the lobe fin fishes and the ray fin fishes. Now we're not really going to focus too much on the difference between the lobe fin and the ray, um, the ray fin, but we are going to be focusing on the differences between the cartilaginous fishes and some of the differences between the um, agnathans as well. All right, so let's start with the agnathans, those jawless fishes that we talked about. So again, they do have mouths, just not a jaw. 
Um, they do have a circular mouth, which is usually got a bunch of these little teeth on the inside. Now the Ignathans can either be parasitic, they can be free living, they can be scavengers. It really depends on the Ignathan you're talking about. So their mouth is going to be modified to actually, you know, be able to uh, eat whatever their actual prey is. Um, so let's see, they have a long cylindrical body. This is kind of like eel-like or snake-like. It's not even really eel because eels have a little bit more girth to their body, but really like a long, skinny, almost like snake-like body. They do not have paired fins, so we're going to talk about fishes and all the characteristics that they have. These are the ones that don't actually have the paired fins, meaning paired on either side. Um, they do not have scales. So again, that's usually characteristic of all fishes. These guys are kind of like the first of the fishes, so they didn't really have all that, like, protective scales. And yes, scales are used as a form of protection. Uh, and again, we do have two different types in the Agnathans. These are going to be your hagfish and your lampreys. All right, so starting with the hagfish, there's about 20 species of hagfish. All of them are going to be marine. This is a little hagfish you can tell right here. He has no eyes. He has no real, I mean... It doesn't really have teeth. It kind of has these like tentacles and this little like, I mean, they do have teeth, but they're really, really little, especially compared to the, the, um, the lampreys because, the, because these guys are going to be scavengers. So these guys are living deep in the ocean, probably in the bottom of the seafloor, and they're looking for carcasses, mammal carcasses, whale carcasses, etc. like that. They're looking to eat and scavenge. So they don't really need the, you know, predatory biting teeth this is more of like the shredding and the just the chewing up because the, re the meat is probably already rotten and already falling apart now these guys are really amazing for one of their adaptations which is slime and you're like why is slime so interesting it is a defensive mechanism so what happens is these guys they're very small they're only about this big um on average and they'll be swimming around and they're basically blind because, again, they live in the deep sea. Why do you need eyes if you live in the deep sea when there's no, there's no light? So they're just swimming around, swimming around blindly with really great noses because they're looking for their food. They're like smelling out the food. And then somebody come, comes along and eats them and they have absolutely no defenses. What are you going to do? Well, in this case, they're going to secrete a slime that when mixed with seawater creates a chemical reaction and turns into this crazy, thick, viscous-like goo. And it really is slime. I mean, it's worse than molasses. So imagine your predator and you just ate something and you're like, other than get this, this has this thing to do about. So meanwhile, you're trying to figure out what's going on with the slime. You are all sorts of this. And remember, you don't have hands. You can't just reach in there and take it out. So you're dealing with all the slime. Meanwhile, the hagfish has swam out of your mouth and is totally taken off. So the slime defense is actually really, really cool. There's lots of videos on this if you guys actually want to Google this. You can, I'm not going to make it mandatory, but you can go and video actual like slime and stuff. It's pretty cool. All right, the next up is the lampreys. The lampreys are next. There's about 30 species. Now, these can be freshwater or marine, okay, unlike the hagfish, which is solely marine. Um, now, most of these guys spend their adult life at sea, uh, but they will actually travel to freshwater to reproduce. Now, we're going to learn about what that's called. I think we might have already learned about that, what's called in uh, ecology, but if not, it's coming up. Okay, living in, in freshwater and then moving to the sea to reproduce, or vice versa, living in the seawater and moving to freshwater to reproduce, like salmon. Um, so basically what happens is the adults will spend most of their life out at sea, and then when they're ready to breed, they'll actually go back, and similar to salmon, kind of like the same place they were born, and they will reproduce once and then die. So you get to have babies, but you don't really survive after that. Um, now the freshwater species are pretty much going to stay in those freshwater sources and just have their babies and stuff like that. Now, these guys can be parasitic, and you're like, that's a pretty big fish to be parasitic, but this really round circular mouth right here is all these little grasping little teeth, and what they're going to do is they're going to actually latch on to different species of fish, and they're going to suck out their blood and nutrients and stuff, so the fish is doing all the work. Meanwhile, the lamprey is just sucking all the fluids out like a parasite, literally the definition of a parasite. Um, so yeah, lampreys. So again, if we look at the difference between hagfish, hagfish, again, they don't have these eyes. They don't have really big apparent teeth. They have these little tiny tentacles, these almost little barbels that they're looking around for food-wise. And they have all these mucus glands going along here. Now, if we look at the lamprey, we can see the big, round, circular mouth right here, lots of little teeth. Um, they do have an actual distinguishable eye. Uh, and again, because they're living in more shallow waters, and therefore an eye would be absolutely necessary. 
All right, now we're going to be moving on to some of the more advanced groups of fishes. Again, we talked about the ignathans. They're kind of like the first fishes. Now we're going to be talking that evolution has happened over long periods of time. And now we're going to start moving on to the chondrichthys and the osteichthys, or the, the more advanced of the, um, the fish groups. So now we're going to talk about fishes that all have these general characteristics. So it's no more like, oh, well, all fish have scales except the ignathans. It's pretty much now forever onwards we're going to have these characteristics. So the first one is a highly efficient set of gills. This is really important because our fish now are getting much larger. And to be larger, you need to get more oxygen. And that means you're going to have to have more efficient gills. Again, little oxygen in the water, you're going to have to pull out whatever you absolutely can with these very efficient gills that they have. Now, they do have scales all over their body. When you think of a fish, you think of scales. So now we're right in that, that frame. Uh, and again, these are going to be used to kind of protect them. Again, you don't want any kind of damage to happen to your soft tissues because then you put yourself at risk to bacteria, to viruses, and stuff like that. And therefore, you want kind of this almost like armor plating on the outside. Now, obviously, some fish scales are thicker than others. If you go sport fishing in Florida and you can pull up a tarpon, their scales are like this big and hard as rocks. If you go out and here and you find a perch, right, you could probably pluck a little scales off. They're just going to flake off on your hand. They're like clear and very, very thin. So the scales will vary not only in size, but in, in texture and, you know, in strength as well. They do have paired fins, so they're not only going to have paired fins up here, but they're actually going to have several sets of paired fins. So if you do see two pairs of fins, that's, that's what that means, one on one side, one on the other. Um, they have jaws, weird, because we're moving away from the agnathans right now. So we were actually moving to the jawed fishes with the hinges. Uh, and they have a variety of different feeding types. We're going to look at some of the types of jaws that they have. And again, just like I've said so many times before, your morphology is going to kind of dictate how you feed. So we're going to look at the jaws of different organisms, and you're actually going to be able to tell just based on their picture what kind of how they feed once you guys know. I know. You're so excited. I know. I can tell. All right, let's see. They do have a lateral line. So lateral line is really cool. It is basically these tiny little cups filled with this little jelly, and as the water vibrates, it kind of vibrates the jelly, which sends a signal down its sensor, um, sensory neurons and organs and all this kind of stuff, and it basically sends it to their brain, and instantaneously they can react and know, I know something's right here. Have you ever been in the ocean and tried to grab a fish? Yeah, good luck. They can literally feel the water move as your hand comes closer to them, so they're gone long before you actually get there. Now, some predators have learned how to get around this lateral line, but that's exactly what it's for. It's used as a predator avoidance to kind of let them know what's going on around them. And it's also used in schooling. So we're going to talk about schooling and how they actually maneuver so, so in sync with each other. And they're not speaking to each other. They're not on the phone going, okay, everyone turn left now. It's literally just the lateral line that's making this possible. As, of course, you probably have already noticed, the fish just have a streamlined body, and that's because they swim. Remember, the water is very viscous. If you spend your whole life swimming, you got to be that aerodynamic shape so that you decrease the amount of drag and therefore decrease the energy that it requires for you to actually swim through that water. Taking a look at the morphology, we have a nice little fish picture right here. Now, every single one of these, no, you do not need to know. Like the Brachiostegal rays, you don't need to know those, but some of the bigger ones we are going to focus on, and that's ones I'm going to talk to you guys right now. So starting up at the top, we have the dorsal fin right here. We've already talked about the dorsal fin. Think like dorsal or back. So these are going to be the fins right along the back. They can either have one or two. Um, sometimes they have one continuous one that goes. Sometimes they have none, but most of the time they have at least one. Now, this little part right here, you can kind of see it looks hard and almost like spiky. These are known as spines. So if you were to push your finger down on the spine, it's not going to go anywhere. It is going to be rigid, and you're basically going to get just a nice hard, and sometimes real sharp, you can actually stab yourself. In things like scorpion fishes and rockfish, they actually have a little poison gland right at the bottom. So as you press that ray down, it's actually going to, sorry, press the spine down, it's actually going to poke through that little venom sac, and it's you're going to actually get the injection of that little venom. Now this part back here, you can kind of see it almost looks a little bit softer. This is known as the rays. And the rays are very flexible. So if you were to push down an array, one, they would all be connected to each other. So the whole thing would pretty much bend down and just kind of flop up. So much more um, flexible in the rays. We have our caudal fin right here. This is also known as the tail fin, the caudal fin. This little area right here is known as the caudal peduncle. Caudal peduncle kind of, again, kind of dictates not really dictates, but it, it kind of alludes to the fact that you kind of know what this fish, 
what its habitat and how it swims. Like I can see this guy's a nice wide caudal peduncle. He's probably really good at maneuvering. So one big flick of his big tail and he can maneuver like crazy. And that would be different from things like a tuna. So a tuna has a very, very small caudal peduncle and that means they're going to be very, very fast swimmers. They're just, their tails are going to be beating very, very fast. Little short bursts of moments, but they're only going forward. They're not trying to maneuver. So the, usually the wider the caudal peduncle, the slower the swimmer, but the more maneuverable the swimmer. Uh, let's see, we have scales right here, right, covering the entire length of the body. There are a couple different types. I'm not going to quiz you guys on them, but these are the morphologies if you wanted to check them out. This is the gill cover, also known as the operculum, okay, just like we learned about the operculum in a mollusk, remember that's the kind of door that shuts in the snail and he goes, yay, now I'm not going to dry up or die, right? The operculum is kind of, again, a gill covering. So for the snail, it's kind of like his whole covering. For the fish, it's a gill covering, right? So it's always protecting or covering something. What else? Oh, uh, the pectoral fins, the ones that are going to be out here, you can kind of think of like your pecs, your chest muscles. Right, so these are the pectoral fins, the ones out here. If we were to move a little bit lower and kind of more sore towards his ventral side, we would actually get the pelvic fins. So you can kind of think of these as like your hip fins, right, if you were a fish. Um, going even lower than that, you're actually going to get the anal fin. And again, this is going to be right next to, you know, his rectum, essentially, right here. Um, so hence the anal fin, because it's located right there. And again, this one, this one, and this one are all going to be those paired fins. The caudal fin can't be paired because it's a tail fin. And these are not considered paired because they're not on either side. It's just dorsal. So it would be dorsal one and dorsal two. Looking on the inside of the fish, we can actually see some pretty unique structures. One of them is this big, usually silvery bladder looking thing. And that's known as the swim bladder. So the swim bladder is an amazing little device, organ, inside the, um, in the fish that they can basically secrete air into, and that helps with buoyancy. So if you're a big heavy fish and you're living mid-water column, you want to be neutrally buoyant. You don't want to be sinking, because then you're going to constantly have to work to stay afloat. You don't want to be floating. You want to be a mid-water fish. You float to the surface, maybe someone's going to eat you. Okay, so you want to stay nice and what's called neutrally buoyant, meaning you're not going up, you're not going down, you're just kind of floating perfectly where you're at. So what they do is they can actually adjust the gases that are located inside the swim bladder to get that nice neutral buoyancy to kind of help them reduce the drag and, re well, not so much the drag, but reduce the stress that the water puts on you. Because there is so much drag in the water, you don't want to be fighting it anymore have to, than you have to. So if you stay nice and buoyant, then you're not really fighting it, you're just kind of cruising laterally. Um, other organs are pretty similar to, you know, what we have or what you should be familiar with. We have the stomach right here. Right off of that, we have what's called the pyloric cecum, and essentially, it's part of the digestive system with all these little fingers. And those fingers are used to you normally absorb nutrients and stuff like that, um, because you really want to get as much energy as you can. You don't know when the next time you're going to eat, so you need to absorb all those nutrients that you possibly can right now, and that's what's going to be helped with a little um, pyloric cecum right here. Moving down to the rest of the intestines and out the anus it completes our digestive system. We have any kind of gonads right here, either testes or ovaries, and fish are um, separate sexes, so you will have male fish and female fish. It's rare that you have a simultaneous hermaphrodite, um, but you can have sequential hermaphrodites. So you can have both and then kind of turn off one and then turn on the other, um, but usually even then they are considered separate sexes, even if they have both parts. Because it's simultaneous, you're one then the other, you're still considered two different sexes. You've just transitioned from one to the other. Um, let's see, we got a tiny little brain right up here. We've got our, where's our heart? Little tiny heart going right along the gills right here. This little baby heart usually only has, um, well, less chambers than us. Usually it has two chambers. Uh, we have a gallbladder. We have the liver. We have all normal intestines that, you know, you would want if you want to survive. Um, these are our muscles going along right here. And they are in these striations. We're going to learn about different types of muscles coming up because there's a difference between red meat fish and white meat fish and that's all in the muscles. So the white is going to be usually the outside. It's used kind of for everyday motion. The red is on the inside and that's used for sustained high speed swimming. So if you were like a, a dolphin fish or a tuna and you needed to like 
fly after that flying fish, your prey, you would trigger those muscles. So that's why tuna have a lot more of that inner red muscle because they need lots of fast swimming and they need lots of energy and that's what's going to be stored. Not only oxygen and um, energy, but like blood and oxygen, which is why it appears red. Different types of muscles. Do you ever wonder why some tuna is like white and some tuna is red? Right? So the white stuff, the outside, the inner stuff would be the red stuff. All right, looking at the differences between sharks and fishes, since we've kind of just lumped them all into fishes, which is true, they are all are fishes. Um, this is a cartilaginous fishes. This is a bony fish. They all have paired fins. They all have gills. They all have scales. All of them are the same. However, the scales in sharks are going to be a little bit different. They are actually modified into what's known as placoid scales, and these essentially are little tiny spikes. If you've ever pet a shark, you could have noticed that it kind of feels like sandpaper. It's really rough. Some species of sharks, especially the pelagic one, those placoid scales are a lot larger because they help reduce the drag. So these tiny little spikes actually help to break the water up, reducing the drag as they swim. So any of those pelagic sharks are going to have a lot more spikes in them. If you've ever seen shark scientists, when they go to hold them, they are wearing gloves. Unlike fish, I mean, you, can, you should wear gloves if you're holding a fish. But they don't really need them as much as they do with sharks because those placoid scales can be really, really sharp. And if you go the wrong way, can shred up your hands. Now, what else? Now, there are a different number of gills in fish and sharks. So usually on sharks, you're going to have five to seven gills. In fact, all sharks have five except the six gill shark and the seven gill shark, which has six and seven respectively. Uh, but these guys do not have an operculum. So they're again considered more ancient than the fishes. So the fishes actually were like, hey, my gills are kind of important. I'm going to put a bony operculum over those to cover them. Whereas the sharks were like, crap, I was around before those operculums existed, so I don't have them. Um, what else? Ah, the tail fins, another really easy way to tell the difference. I mean, if you have never seen a shark or a fish in your life, I mean, I'm pretty sure you guys know the difference. But if I put this on a test, here's what your actual scientific answer. The caudal fins right here are actually going to be shaped different. The tuna has what's called a homocercal, or same shape. So in this case, his top one and his bottom one are about the exact same. Now, it's not perfect. No one's out there measuring, but it's about the exact same. When it comes to a shark, they have what's called a heterocercal, or different. And with the when it comes to a shark, it is significantly different. So you can see this much larger top lobe than the bottom lobe. And it really uh, really um, amplified in things like thresher sharks. So the thresher shark is a super long tail. And so, in fact, sometimes the entire length of his body in just tail. So it's like him and then a whole another him, just tail, right? And that's that heterocercal, the different shapes, larger on the top, smaller on the bottom. So again, if you don't know, look at their tail or look at their operculum or just, you know, learn what a fish and a shark is. I don't know. I feel like, I feel like babies know what this is. All right, getting on to the chondrichthys. So now we just talked about fishes. So all the characteristics so far we've talked about, these are just fishes. Now we're actually going to be focusing on the uh, cartilaginous fishes, the chondrichthys. Okay, so I always ask you guys for like key characteristics, like what makes these different? What's the difference between chondrichthys and osteichthys? And I swear half of you forget to put that they have a cartilaginous skeleton. They're the cartilaginous fishes. They have a cartilaginous skeleton. That should be like one number one. Okay, so that, you know, for me right now today is number one. Um, they do have placoid scales. Remember those spiky scales? They do have a jaw, right? Because they're sharks, jaws, get it? Um, they do have paired fins, just like fishes. They do have five to seven gill slits. Remember, no operculum, right? Just the gill slits. Remember, all sharks have five except the six gill shark and the seven gill shark. Oh, here's a cool one. They have what's called spiracles. So imagine I have my eyes and my nose and my mouth and my ear, but then I imagine I have another hole right here near my head, right? This is actually something that they use to breathe with. And you're like, what do you mean? They're already in the water. Well, imagine if you are a bottom dwelling shark and your mouth is on the bottom, like an angel shark, and your mouth is on the bottom, which means your mouth is rubbed against sand. Do you really want to take a breath of sand and have sand, sharp, scratchy, itchy sand going in your gills, your really fragile gills? No. So in that case, you wouldn't want to breathe from your, your mouth. What you want to do, say you have two extra holes on the top of your head, you suck water in through there and then pass them over your gills. You're kind of bypassing your mouth. 
Now, when it comes to the more pelagic sharks, the sharks that are constantly swimming all the time, you, you don't really need spiracles for the breathing. You just open your mouth, and then the water passes in your mouth and over your gills. So that's why, if you've ever seen a great white swim, they kind of swim like this. They're not shocked. They're not stunned. They're not thinking about something. They're literally just letting the water flow through their mouth and over their gills. Now, this is a common misconception that all sharks need to swim or they die. Yes, some sharks need to swim or they will die. But, like I said, the angel shark is a bottom-dwelling shark. So it lives most of the, its life on the bottom. So do sharks, uh, sorry, so do skates and rays. They're also under the chondric themes, and therefore how do they breathe? With the use of the spiracles, those holes that they're going to suck in and then be able to pass water up and over their gills without sand. Okay, um, I think we talked about this already before, but I'm going to talk about it again. So there are males and female sharks. You can always tell a male shark or skate or ray because they will actually have two modified fins that look kind of like little penises because they're essentially hanging down from their body and they look like dual penises. Um, now they're not an actual penis, but it is functionally the same. So essentially what it is is a rolled up fin kind of uses a tube and that's what they're going to send their sperm with and um, into the male, into the female because again, they are direct copulators and so they will actually have intercourse and therefore he needs to deliver his sperm to her directly and they'll do that through the use of those little claspers. So here's a couple pictures of the spiracles. Again, this is the smaller reduced one on a great white shark and this is the much larger one on this little, um, this little round ray right here. So looking at the body morphology of a shark, it's all pretty similar to a fish. We've got the pectoral fins, the dorsal fin, the pelvic fin, the anal fin, Caudal fin right here, first dorsal, second dorsal. Sometimes the dorsal fins will actually have a spine. Now this isn't to like stab other things and be like, ah, get away from me. No, well, it is kind of actually to get away from me. It's a defense mechanism. So these, these sharks are usually smaller sharks. Like we have off our coast, we have the horn shark. Really cute, they're about, oh, they're about that big. Right, if you're small, that great white could come over and eat you in just a second. Not that it probably would, but in that case, if he bites down on you and you on your dorsal fin have a spine, he's going to get that right to the roof of his mouth and that's going to hurt. That's going to make him jump back and let go. So those are not, a good, again, they're not going to shoot it off at you. It's not going to try to hurt you. It's just used as a protection for them. Um, and same thing with the actual spines on a, like a stingray. They're not using it to kind of whip their tail around and be like, bah, and stab you and kill you. They're using it as a protection measure. Right? If they have to defend themselves, they happen to have that spine. And it is that dorsal spine, because again, even if they're flat, that's still considered their dorsal spine. Tail flying around. Um, this right here is again, going to be a typical picture. We have the claspers right here on a male, the claspers right here on a male. Um, they're pectoral fins are actually modified into what's known as wings. So if you are a ray or a skate, it is considered your wings, not your fins. However, they are still paired. Sometimes you actually have a little spines going all the way down the back. And again, usually just a protective measure so that no one tries to eat you. What else? Um, let's talk about sharks. Let's talk about sharks. I love sharks. Let's just keep talking about sharks. Um, most of the sharks are actually going to have two dorsal fins, so just the one, and not just the one, but the two. Pretty much all sharks are going to be marine, however, there are some sharks known as urihaline that can actually travel up into fresh waters. This basically means that they can tolerate a wider range of salinities and therefore go from the salt water to the fresh water without it negatively affecting them. Bull sharks are a common one that can actually do this. Um, now some other species can actually go into estuaries and they can have their pups and therefore they're more resilient to this fresh water than normal. Um, but again, it's kind of used as a protective measure of feeding in an area that no other shark can feed in. So it really does, it's an advantageous thing for them to be able to withstand those different salinity levels. Here's something that sharks have that, well, chondrichthys have that no other group have. And this is so cool. I really wanted to do like a doctor's thesis on this. It's called the ampullae of Lorenzini. And essentially what it is, is they're tiny little pores that go all along the face area of the shark and they're used to detect electrical signals. So our heart as it beats provides an electrical signal. These sharks can pick up on that. So it's really amazing and fascinating how good they are at doing this. I mean, they can see you in complete darkness. They can see if you're buried in the sand just by sensing with all these tiny little pores, the very small electromagnetical impulses or pulses that are actually coming off of you, which is just crazy. They also believe that this is how they navigate throughout the world. Great white sharks travel all over the planet. It's, well, 
usually in the northern hemisphere of seven that has they kind of have their territories but how can you a shark who doesn't have gps on their phone or even a phone or even hands literally travel the entire length of our coast and navigate it almost perfectly every single time they can find their way to hawaii like that guadalupe island in mexico like that they're like i don't know we're talking tiny islands in the middle of the entire ocean and they're like got this and they just go straight there so this is again what they believe that's actually contributing to that is they're picking up on the electromagnetic fields of the planet that is so cool to me that is just ampy leave lorenzini man wish we had these then you guys wouldn't rely on gps so much <laughs> all right um oh sharks can also detect you if you're in the sand if you're completely buried in the sand especially hammerhead sharks that have the big long wide hammer part that's what's all covered in Ampulae Lorenzini. So essentially, they're like a giant metal detector. And they're kind of cruising along the bottom into the... Gotcha. And then they're going to eat you. Sharks are fantastic, guys. Do you know sharks are older than trees? Modern day trees did not exist on this planet, but sharks did. That is so cool to me. And yeah, sharks were around when the dinosaurs were. Not, of course, the exact same species, but like the Megalodon. Yeah. And no, no, there are no Megalodons still alive in the ocean. I don't care what Jason Statham tries to tell you. That was a terrible movie, by the way. Read the book. The book is so much better. It's called Meg. Not the Meg. Anyway, okay, I digress. Uh, oh, all right. Since we're talking about sharks, we have to bring up the facts. The elephant in the room, shark finning, and all sorts of other shark predation that, that humans are doing. So poaching, it's not even predation. It's just straight up poaching and fishing. We are over harvesting sharks like nobody's business. In fact, we are devastating shark populations all over the world for things like shark fin. So shark fin soup, it's a delicacy in Asia. They say, oh, it has cancer. It has nothing. It is just soup. So you're talking about killing millions, if not billions of sharks a year. It's something like 100,000 shark sight every hour. 100,000 shark sight every hour. And guess what? These sharks are not broadcast spawners. These sharks are not shooting off babies every six months. These sharks take a long time to sexually mature and even longer to actually have babies after that. So our populations are being devastated by finning and by poaching and stuff like that. I mean, they're taking their livers, they're taking their skin, they're taking their fins, they're taking their teeth. I mean, they're taking everything they possibly can. And the shark, it's, it's devastating to the shark population. So don't be afraid of sharks. Sharks are good. Sharks are necessary. Sharks are needed. Sharks are top predators, man. They keep our ecosystems in check. We need them. We can't take them all. We can't kill them. Protect our sharks. Let's talk about a couple different types of sharks. We got this big bad boy right here. This is known as a whale shark. They're really cool. Um, they're basically, they're big. They're spotted. They look scary because they're whale shark. They're so, they're as big as a whale. They eat krill. They are baleen feeders. They are basically, uh, well, they're not baleen feeders because they're not whales. They're essentially filter feeders, right? They're taking in the water, they're taking out the krill and the copepods and the basically small fishes and every other kind of microorganism that they can, and then they're releasing that water. Uh, basking sharks, same kind of thing. Again, these are gonna be the filter feeders. Even though these two sharks are the largest sharks on the planet, they're completely harmless and could not hurt you if they wanted to. I mean, maybe they could like smack you with their tail, but other than that, they're not gonna hurt you. So don't be afraid of sharks. Getting to the sharks you might have to be concerned about. The great white sharks, the tiger sharks, bull sharks, mako sharks, some hammerhead sharks. They're all really fascinating, but look at the size compared to. I mean, that's still a great white shark. It's still pretty big. I know. I've been in the water with them. They're big. Um, but they're not. They're not the mindless killing machine that everybody makes you think they are. They're absolutely not. Getting down to the very small ones, we have some bottom dwellers like the nurse shark. We have the angel shark. The saw shark right here. We have some teeny tiny baby ones like the spined pick-me shark or the cigar shark, which literally is the size of a cigar and could probably fit in my hand just like this. Yeah, so I have friends who are like, I'm scared of all sharks. I think all sharks are trying to kill you. You're like, really? That, that cigar shark is trying to kill you? Come on. <laughs> Don't be afraid of sharks. Sharks are great. Let's talk reproduction because, you know, fun facts with reproduction. Sharks reproduce in a variety of different ways. Remember, we talked about the fertilization, which is coming from direct fertilization, so direct copulation, really, physical intercourse. Um, but they can have live birth. This is known as vivipary. So essentially, they just pup live pups, and those pups swim off on their own, and they do great. Benefit in this is you actually have pups who are like 98%, 99% probably going to survive. They're large enough. They're self-sustaining. They're going to be off on their own. 
So even though it takes a lot more parental care, you make sure that those pups survive. Unlike the broadcast bonding, which takes zero parental care, and 99% of those are going to die, this is actually 99% survival rate, and I'm just throwing that number out. I don't actually know because it would depend on the species of shark. Um, but those pups are most likely going to survive because you put the time and the effort in, and then when you release them, they're large enough to survive on their own. Now, some actually lay egg cases. These egg cases are known as mermaid's purses, and we're going to see one in just a second. But this is known as ovipary. So it's not vivipary, meaning living. It's ovipary, meaning you're kind of born into almost like a shell. It's like an egg casing. You can kind of think of it as like a shark shell-ish. Now, some of them kind of combine the two, and they're like, we're going to lay an, uh, an egg casing, but we're going to keep it inside of us. And you're like, what are, you, what are you talking about? So essentially, it's if you blend the two. So you have the egg that's inside, but it hatches while inside out of said casing and then swims out of you alive. So you still have the egg casing, that kind of egg like inside of you, but then you give live birth. So it's known as ovovivipary. You're kind of combining the two vivipary and ovipary, ovovivipary. And I know this, that one's kind of hard to wrap your head around, but. It's like hatching from the case inside, but then they come out fully alive and formed. I know. Read, watch this video a few more times. Or check out, Google it. I mean, it's actually like some, they have some cool videos on exactly sh which type of sharks does what. Um, and can kind of show you this a little bit better than I can just talk about birthing internal sharks. All right. Moving on to a different type of chondrichthy, we have the rays. So the rays are, you know, I'm sure you've heard of stingrays, but... All stingrays are rays, but not all rays are stingrays. In fact, there's a lot of uh, rays that don't have stingers. In fact, there's even rays in the stingray family that don't have stingers. I know. Uh, let's see. Rays always have live birth. They're always viviparous. Okay? They do have their pectoral fins. We talked about this. They're modified into what's called a wing, and they kind of do this undulating fashion where they roll it, and it's almost like flapping a skirt, and that's kind of how they move along. They do have five pairs of gill slits. Again, sharks always have five to seven, mostly five. Um, these are located on the underside of their body. And you're like, wait a minute, aren't the gills supposed to take it? And this is why you have the spiracles. So the spiracles are going to bring the water in and push it over your gills. You're still going to get that fresh water coming in, but you're not actually going to get that. Um, you're not going to get the sand and stuff if you were to actually like be breathing upwards. Um, let's see. Razor... I mean, if you look at them, you kind of can tell where they're going to be. They spend most of their life sitting on the bottom. Now, there are some pelagic rays, like the manta rays, that basically spend most of their life swimming. Um, but the, most of the rays that we're going to be talking about are probably the ones that are going to be sitting on the bottom, like the brown rays that we have, the brown, or the round rays that we have off our coast. Small, the ones you probably have to work, watch out for when you're um, in the summer, because they're at like three feet of water, and they're all just baby rays everywhere. Uh, don't get hit by one of those. Those hurt. Now, these guys do not have the bitey, bitey teeth because they don't chase down their prey. What they're doing is they're kind of ambush predators. So they're going to be sitting there and they're going to be swimming along and any kind of invertebrates that's going to be in the soil, that's what they're going to be doing. They're going to be bashing and they're going to be grabbing. Or what they're going to be doing is feeding on things like mollusks or crabs. Okay, something with a shell, they're going to be like, yeah, it's cute you have a shell and all, but I have these really flat, hard, smashing, grinding teeth and I'm going to eat your shell. So a lot of the times you'll see some of these rays just tear through clams, oysters, um, arthropods, like crabs and stuff like that. They just, just demolish their little shells and their exoskeletons because of their the way that their teeth are modified. And again, you can kind of predict on how they're going to eat. If you see a big, flat, crushy thing, you know they're not going to be biting at fish. They're probably going to be crushing more things like shells. Now, the spine at the end, again, they don't all have them, but when they do, a lot of the times there's going to be some kind of little venom gland right at the very end of that, and that's going to be used for kind of protection. Um, so the venom basically, as soon as you make contact with it, it's going to be injected, kind of like the spines we talked about, injected into the skin. And this is going to start that burn, that searing pain. Um, yeah, not pleasant. So if you don't get hit by one of these, do the stingray shuffle. Okay, well, they're talking about, it always used to be the stingray shuffle where you kind of shuffle your feet as you walk. So because you, if you step on them like that, then they can't feel you coming. So if you shuffle, then you hit their wing first, and then they're like, oh, and then they take off. Now what they're saying is stomp. Because as you stomp, what you do is you push the water away from you, and as you push the water away from you, they can feel it from farther away, and then it'll take off knowing that you're coming. So I don't know what to tell you anymore. Do the stingray shuffle or the stingray stomp. I don't know. Just be careful. <laughs> That's what you should do. 
Um, okay, so let's talk about a really cool type of ray. It's called a torpedo ray. We have it off our coast, and it is dangerous because it's also known as the electric ray. So on the ends of its wings, it actually has these kind of a little electrical capacity. I, I can't even ex begin to explain to you exactly what's going on here in such a brief lecture, but essentially they can conduct electricity. So what they do is they'll actually turn their fins up. So this is me and I, these are my wings. I can actually turn my wings up above my head and then I will create an electrical zap in between it. And that's how I stun my prey. So I will sit on the bottom and wait for my prey to go up here. And then as soon as they do, zap, and then boom, instant like cardiac arrest, they're just pff, over and boom, then they'll just eat them. And it's, it's death is quick. Now, crazy fact, they've actually found a bunch of divers underwater in California with their gear working, lots of air, but they're just dead. And they have no pre-existing con conditions. They have no health problems. These are good divers. And they're just like, they went missing and then you find them dead. And what they're thinking is they might have swam over torpedo rays and got that electrical shock to their heart. Their heart stopped and then that's it. And that is to me crazy. And that's one of the things I always think about when I'm out swimming, you know, because these guys are found a little bit deeper. And so I'm always thinking, I'm always looking below me. And I was like, you're not going to scare me, you little torpedo ray. But it's something to consider if you guys are a diver or if you ever go deep in the water out there. Don't worry about it if you're snorkeling. It's not going to happen. All right, so looking at some of these rays right here, so we have some of these little sting rays on the bottom. We have more of our pelagic rays. You can see the gills and the mouth right down here. Um, these are the little nostrils. They're, again, sniffing around. We got some tagalongs on the manta ray right here. We've got a little spotted eagle ray, which I see in Florida all the time. These are just super, super cool. So again, you can kind of, based on their body morphology, especially if you have these long, more pointed wings, it's probably more likely you're going to be pelagic. And then if you're this big, round, flat, you're just really going to be flat and sit on the bottom. Getting on to skates, let's talk about some skates. We have, rays and skates are almost, I wouldn't say almost identical, but they're very similar. Okay, they're also dorsally, dorsal ventrally flattened, meaning kind of like squished. Um, they also have the wings modified. They have the spiracles because, again, they're going to do that buccal breathing. They're going to breathe um, that water over their gills. Um, but unlike rays, skates never give life birth. Okay, so they're ov oviparous, right? They're always going to be laying egg cases. And you can actually tell the species, you can sometimes tell the species of, of uh, skate it is based on the shape of the mermaid's purse, the egg case, which same thing with the sharks, which is actually pretty cool. Um... Blah, 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 blah. I'm just talking here. Oh, again, the same kind of thing. They're also going to have um, this kind of like more crushing teeth to feed on the mollusk and the arthropod. So very, very similar in structure and function to the rays. Now, big difference, though, a lot of these guys are going to have this like very pronounced snout that some of the rays aren't going to have. Usually, typically more kind of like diamond shaped pointed wings, not so much round. Um, but again, the pelagic rays kind of have those almost pointed wings as well. So it's kind of, oh. um, these guys will never have a stinger. These guys do not have a, a spine. So when we were talking about the stingrays, these guys are not going to have that because they're not rays. Uh, looking at the differences again, we can see this nice, really defined pointed snout different than this little pointed snout. Um, this guys can actually have thorns on his back as well as these guys who have spines or thorns. This one we'll have the dorsal fins all the way back here and a distinct tiny little caudal fin where these are almost kind of like what's called fin folds caudal fin folds so it's not like a distinct flat it's more of kind of like a folded you can almost think of like the end of an arrow like all those like you know feathers are kind of coming off of that it's kind of what's going on here um let's see you can still have the claspers in the males uh that was pretty much it Eyes, spiracles, again right here, eyes, spiracles, just like the rays. But you should know some key characteristics, uh, key differences between skates and rays, so I could easily ask that for you on a question. Live birth, yeah. no spines, etc. All right, jumping a little bit backwards, we're going to be talking about those ancient fish, those ratfishes. Now all these guys have kind of been around for a long time. Like I said, sharks are older than trees, which is cool. But these ratfishes are kind of like half shark half fish they're just kind of weird looking and they're called ratfishes because they have this kind of weird pointy nose and then a long rat like tail so it go it tapers off it goes from wider to much skinnier as it goes along 
um, hence ratfish. Now these guys are pretty much all deep water. These are going to be deep water marine fishes for sure. Um, they do have their gill slits, just one pair of gill slits, usually covered by skin. So it's not an operculum because that's bone, but it's kind of like a flap of skin that just kind of covers them a little bit. Um, pretty common in, in chondrichthys. Again, if you look at sharks, there's, their gills aren't completely open. They do have that little flap in between that kind of covers their gills. Now, these guys are feeding on crustaceans and mollusks, like a lot of these um, chondrichthys that we've seen so far, and that's because there's a ton of them around. So good food source. You don't have to be super quick. You don't have to have the biting, bitey jaws to actually be able to catch and eat these guys. Now, they do have a heterocercal tail. Remember the two different lobes? We're going to see that in just a second. Usually larger on top, smaller on the bottom. And that's pretty much it for the um, the raft fishes. This is what one looks like. Again, you can see this kind of weird schnoz that he's got. This is known as a rostrum, and sometimes it can be really long. Like some of them have a really long rostrum that's going all the way out here. You can see the paired fins right here, right here, and right here. Dorsal fin one, dorsal fin two. More like spines right here, raised going back here. Head arster cow tail with the longer top part and the shorter bottom part. Moving on to the bony fishes, the last of our group. So the last of the fishes, at least. Our bony fishes are, again, bony fishes. So if I ask you the differences between the two, tell me one is a cartilaginous skeleton, the other is a bony skeleton. You guys always kind of like blank here. Um, remember, these guys are going to have the operculum, not like the gill covered with the skin, but we're actually going to have an operculum. They do have gills like all fishes. They do have a hinged jaw, allowed for the bitey bitey. Um, and they're also going to have that homo cercal tail that we talked about, the two equal lobes of the tail. Now, these guys do have flat scales, not like the placoid scales that we talked about. They're going to be um, tenoid. They're going to be cycloid. They're going to be all sorts of different shapes. Um, and again, this is used to protect the body. The tissues are squishy, and when you're in water, they're very vulnerable to puncture, infection, all that kind of stuff. So it's really important to have a nice covering all over your body with those gills to give you even the smallest amount of protection. That lateral line is pretty much uh, what these guys use so often and so well. Remember those little jelly cups that vibrate and they can detect what's going on around them. Just the, the most unique thing for them that they can actually use. Now sharks will also have a lateral line as well, but they don't use them quite like this. They're using all sorts of other different senses, but these guys, that lateral, lateral line is super important to have. These guys are the ones that also have swim bladder. Now sharks, this is another difference between sharks and fishes, sharks do not have a swim bladder. They have big oily livers. Their oil, remember oil and water don't mix, the oil is actually going to help them float. So that's actually how they control their buoyancy. But these bony fishes don't have a big oily liver, they have the, the um, swim bladder. So that's what they're going to add gases to to allow them to get that buoyancy in the water column. So another difference between sharks and fishes. Now, when it comes to bony fishes, these are not always predators. A lot of times they're being eaten. So they want to avoid being eaten. And they can do this in several different ways. They do counter shading. Well, they do counter shading. They have counter shading, which means darker on the top, lighter on the bottom. Counter shading. Two different colors for two different sides. Now you're saying, wait a minute, sharks have that too. I've seen what a great white shark looks like. Yeah, the darker top part and the, the white belly is counter shading. And that's because if you're looking down to the depths of the ocean, they appear dark, so does the ocean. And if you're underneath them and you're looking up, they appear white, just like the surface where the sun would be. So this counter shading allows them to blend in to their open ocean environment um, based on which direction you're actually looking at them at. Uh, what else? I think that's pretty much it for counter shading. Ah, if you are not counter shaded, maybe you're a slow swimmer and you're like, I'm not counter shaded. I don't know how to hide. You kind of want to be a little bit tricky. So there's a couple different things that you could do. One is you could actually have um, bars or stripes. And when you have bars or stripes all over your body, it kind of breaks up your fish morphology. So when you're looking at the outline of the fish, but you have all these stripes in it, you're like, well, is that one organism? Is that a couple organisms? Remember, fish are kind of dumb. So are a lot of other animals. Okay, so they're going to be looking at you and then just the, having the bars or the stripes are going to kind of confuse you and be like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know now which way you're, ah, this is confusing. And again, just that simple confusion can deter a predator enough to not eat you. Now, if you're not going to have that, you can also be what's called cryptic. And cryptic you can kind of think of as like camouflage. You are blending into the background, right? You are hiding in plain sight. So when you're cryptic, 
typically you're trying to pretend to be something else. So rockfish are trying to look like rocks. Um, sea um, um, kelpfish are trying to blend in with kelp. You know, all sorts of things that you can kind of blend in with so that you're not to be able to be easily seen by a predator. So the predator will hopefully just swim by you, not detect you, and then um, you can avoid them. Another one is circular patterns. So sometimes a predator comes up on you, but you have this big eye spot, and they're like, whoa, that's a huge eye. I, you might be bigger than me. You might eat me. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going to take off. But really, it's an eye spot near your tail. It's not even near your face. So not only does it confuse a predator, but your butt also looks like your face, so they don't actually know which way you're going. Are you looking this way? Or are you looking that way? I don't know. So you have these big eye spots, and something comes up on it. They're like, oh, oh my god, you, you look really big. I'm out of here. When in reality, you're much smaller, but you have these big fake circular eye spots that kind of mimic an eye and therefore can deter predators. So those are big colorations or big um, circular patterns. Ah, warning coloration is something that we talked about when it comes to nudibranchs. So remember that bright, bright, vibrant color usually means stay away from me because I am poisonous. So if you eat me, you're going to get sick. So that warning coloration kind of says, hey, I'm not to be messed with. It's a warning, and, and it does actually work pretty well in, uh, in the marine environment. Now, your body shape can also kind of allude to your behavior. Remember, we talked about the thickness of the caudal peduncle. A very small caudal peduncle means your tail can just beat really, really quickly. A thicker caudal peduncle means it's not going to move as fast, but one big flick of your tail, and phew, you're out of there. Or you're going to be able to maneuver really, uh, maneuver really, really well. Um... Flatfish have an excellent body morphology. They don't even bother swimming around like this. They go, mm, and in fact, when it comes to a flatfish, they're born normal. And what happens as they develop is one eye rotates across the skull and ends up on the same side. It's crazy. Google pictures of a flatfish skeleton, like, a, like the skull, because it's literally twisted. I've done this. I did a dissection on this, and it looks like you took the fish and just twisted its skull. Oh, man, that's so cool. And again, it's because the eyes are rotating onto the other side. Now, with both eyes on one side, you can lay like this, and you're basically looking upwards. So you have two eyes looking upwards, and you're remaining on the bottom. This is great because they are ambush predators. So they're essentially laying on the bottom, looking like the bottom, waiting for someone to swim above them. And things like some certain species of flatfish will actually will have really big eye spots, too. So these big circular patterns. And if you were to look down, it looks like this giant face looking up at you. Or really, the fish is probably about that wide and probably only about that big. Well, actually, some halibut get, like, really big. All right, so taking a look at this, this is some cryptic coloration that we have right here. Can you see the fish? No? It's right here. This is our little fish right here. In fact, you can see it's two eyes and it's big smiley face. Just kidding. It looks like it's frowning. All right, this looks like a stonefish and pretending to be a rock, hence cryptic coloration. This is kind of the disruptive coloration. You're just like, whoa, I've got all this over here. I've got all this going here. You can't actually see where my eyes is. That might look like a mouth to someone. So again, you're kind of breaking up that body morphology to the point where like, mm, I don't know what you are. Same thing here, breaking up these stripes, uh, these bars. They're going to break up that body morphology. That kind of looks like a plant. Maybe it looks like it's those little tentacles flying out. It definitely does not look like a fish, especially if the visibility was bad or, you know, maybe you're dumb because you're a fish. Here's where we actually have, um, again, definitely breaking up like that. If you were to look at it first glance, you're like, what is that? Especially if you look at it against the background, you're like, is that, is that some kind of coral? Is that a polyp? I don't really understand what you are. Breaking up that body morphology. And then clearly here you can see those big old eye spots. So look at his actual eye. So much bigger. So again, it might think that your predator might think that you're much larger than you actually are in reality. Um, also with the stripes to kind of help up that body morphology. But then if you're looking at it, maybe his eyes are like this. and Maybe he's really big. Or maybe he's this is his eyes and he's going that way. When in reality, this is his eye and he's going this way. So all of these things are used to kind of confuse predators, which is great because, again, not a lot of these marine organisms are that smart. And therefore, simple things like this can just help you get that smallest little advantage to avoid being eaten at a particular time. Now, now I'm not saying that butterfly fish don't get eaten and neither do cowfish, but, you know, you know what I'm saying. And that is another fantastic lecture. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me. We have one more fish lecture to do, Marine Fishes Part 2, and that will be coming up very shortly. Thank you so much again, and hey, don't pollute. I know, I'm done polluting. I'm done talking. <laughs> All right, guys, have a wonderful rest of your night, and um, I'll see you very shortly.